Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of personal growth. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined as usual by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm good. And I'm looking forward to the grab bag. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's great to answer some questions from our listeners. We're going to be opening up our mailbag today, and we got a ton of questions from all of you. And I picked out a few of them that I thought were particularly interesting. Before we get into it today, I wanted to give you a quick reminder about our Patreon page. You can find us at patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And if you would like to submit a question to be answered on the show, we regularly ask our patrons what they're interested in. So it's a great way to get your questions answered by me or by Rick. So I'll start with this first one. Rick, I've heard you paraphrase a quote from Tolstoy a few times. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Would you mind explaining that a little? Then my family are examining our routines and values. Would you please share the characteristics, values, or routines that happy families pursue? So to just quickly answer the first part of that question and give people a little bit of uh, context, the quote comes from the, I think it's actually the first line of Anna Karenina. And the basic idea is that most happy families share some common attributes. Like for example, they might all respect the other members of the family. But there are any number of specific problems that an individual could face that could lead to unhappiness in the family system as a whole. And the unique stories or experiences that could lead to those specific issues are going to vary wildly for people. So that's a little context on the quote itself. And dad, for the second part, what do you think happy families have in common? Well, first, I find myself revisiting that quote and thinking about really large cultural differences around the world mm. or and also regional differences and other kinds of differences inside a country in which from the outside, different families look really different. Um, on the other hand, there's the general principle, to put it a certain way, that uh, as excellence increases, there's a convergence on a standard. So if you imagine watching a bunch of five-year-olds in a gymnastics class, you could see a thousand of them they would be all over the place and there'd be a wide range. Hmm. You know. On the other hand, if you were to observe a thousand college level gymnasts doing the same routines, you know, on the high bar, the rings, on the floor, tumbling, whatnot, they would be quite like each other. And you would need very eagle-eyed judges to start to distinguish among them, you know, and rate some higher than others and give some prizes or not. So there is that kind of convergence on a standard. Then with regard to families, you know, there's so many kinds of families, right? Mm -hmm. Our notion of the nuclear heterosexual couple with two and a half kids and one and a half cats. <laughs> White picket fence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole uh, there are so many versions of that. And my you yeah. know, template for family is hunter-gatherer band. That was the family. And many of, which, many of the members of which were kin with each other. Aunties, uncles, cousins, that's the family. So there are, you know, many kinds of families. Fundamentally, I want to highlight, if I could, several things, though, that people might reflect on in terms of their own family of origin and also in their current family, let's say. First, uh, there's an absence of craziness. <laughs> really important. <laughs> would, you, would you mind describing what you mean by that? People are not slugging each other. They're not breaking sure. the furniture. Yeah. They're not, uh, there's no possibility of uh, threatened or actual violence. Yeah. There's no, um, you know, problematic drug or alcohol abuse, low on the crazy. Second, a certain amount of basic functionality. You know, there's food, there, there are meals. Uh, people um, are not at war with their neighbors. Kids are taken to school on time, wearing the proper clothes. There's basic functionality. And this is where you can see the ways in which poverty is the, most pernicious mental health factor in the world. Things that are so really disruptive create a lot of adverse childhood experiences and also adverse adult experiences and obstruct positive childhood experiences. So that's that's the second uh, obvious thing. And then maybe I'll just toss in a third. I think that one of the one of the hallmarks of a truly happy family is twofold: the capacity 
to make agreements and repair broken agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coupled with basic warmth and goodwill. Basic warmth and goodwill flowing among all the players, that there's mutual warm regard. Because if you have any one of those bonds that's characterized by active hostility or mistreatment, that's that's very problematic. Just sitting together around the dinner table, whoa, you can just feel it. Each of the people matter to the other people. That That characterizes happy families. I think that's a great list for starters. And I took a look at this too and went through it and kind of thought about it a little bit because I thought it was a really interesting question. The first thing that I would highlight is what I'll call a sense of belonging. The family becomes a part of your identity and members feel like they are a part of it. Um, And I think that a big part of that is a second quality that I would name, which is some sense of authenticity. The members aren't regularly lying to each other. They don't feel like they have to lie to each other also. Yeah, they feel like they can bring some version of their authentic self, hopefully most of it. it it's pretty rare to bring all of your authentic self to the table uh, inside of most families. But hey, you know, you shoot for 80, 90 percent of it, right? Then uh, another one that I said is very, very similar to what you said earlier, which gets to responsibility taking. Members take responsibility for their own behavior. And then security. You don't feel like you're at threat really any kind of significant threat from the other members of the family system. And a sign of security, which might be its own value, is open lines of communication. If you have an issue with another person or about something that happened, you feel like you can express it in a way without Mm -hmm. having your security be threatened by somebody else. Then connected to that, fairness. Mm -hmm. I think that you see fairness in most relatively healthy families. Um, This doesn't mean that everything is 100% equal, but there's a relatively equitable distribution of both effort and resources within the family. And that is particularly the case when you control for a bunch of variables like age and ability and so on. And maybe related to that, are there expectations? Are those expectations clear and well-known and realistic? And are the rules evenly applied within the family system? Or is it a situation where a lot of rules exist for the kids, but not a lot of rules so much for the parents for a variety of different reasons? And I think that can be a, a big problem inside of family systems, a lack of fairness. And then maybe finally, this is sort of a wild card I was thinking of, is uh, flexibility. Uh, because the only constant is change, and families grow and shrink relationships change over the course of a life. Uh, People change core aspects of identity. And in order to survive all of that, healthy families are really flexible, right? They can roll with the punches a little bit. Uh, What do you think about that list? I think as usual, you ought to get a PhD. No, I'm not. I don't think you ought to go get a PhD. I mean, you probably are developing one de facto, actually. Oh, thanks, Dad. In clinical psychology, seriously. Two things that strike me just from my own background in family systems yeah, work, yeah, go ahead. which is really interesting stuff. Um, so I'm going to drop in a few characteristics of problematic families and happy yeah, families, great. as it were. Healthy families don't have them so much. So a healthy family has a combination of differentiation and integration. In other words, Ooh, on love the one, this. yeah, yeah and, and which characterizes healthy complex systems in general. On the one hand, um, <clears throat> Everybody is kind of allowed to have their individuality and differences are, they're tolerated, they're accepted. You actually sent your mom and me, as you know, a video recently about how, you know, mom plays bridge. And, oh. <laughs> and when she's constantly, she's sort of kibitzing and signaling what cards she has, you know, like, <laughs> or her face goes, oh, no, <laughs> you know, when you like bid a different thing. And there are differences, right? I, whatever, you're more committed to like, Rules. Committed to the bed of stoicism while <laughs> yeah, I'm stoicism, yeah, totally. poker face. You know, so there are differences. So on the one hand, there's differentiation. They don't want to go into the family business or they don't want to become a doctor. Uh, they're, they have a different calling. There's differentiation. You, know, you make room for that. Um, there's also, though, integration. There's connection. There's a sense of we. We are together. All four of us or all six of us, of all three of us, are comfortable together. We can go on a car ride together without there being this really chilly silence, you know, uh, from one of the four people in the car. Related to that, there is not what's called triangulation. 
And one of the classic forms of that, there was a lot of work on this in family systems early on, is you have the child and the parents, and basically one parent really bonds with the child against the other parent. And that can then create cycles in which the parent who bonds with the child is more the permissive parent, which then forces the other parent who's less bonded to play more of the role of the authority figure, which then drives the kid even further in the direction of Disneyland dad, let's say, or some version of that, uh, in a way that's really problematic. And that kind of, or you, you start having triangulation in which one child gets played, pushed into the role of being the parentified child or the adultified child. We did a podcast on that at one time. Uh, and their kind of function as the confidant of one particular parent, uh, including about their issues with the other parent. Now that that's problematic. Triangulation is problematic. Um, the last one is family secrets. It goes to what you said about mm. authenticity. Uh, you know, where you just don't tell the kid that they were adopted and you figure you'll let them in on it when they're turn when they turn 18, but it's just something in the air that's problematic. To give a few maybe like slightly less technical examples of yeah. uh, things that can crop up in families that I think are things that are symptomatic of less healthy systems, there are two that really stand out to me. The first is walking on eggshells. Like when you feel like you have to really dance around something, I think that it connects to the family secrets thing a little bit, which implies this lack of either authenticity or security inside of the system. And then a second one that really stands out to me is just ignoring certain kinds of underlying issues. Uh, one way that I've seen this commonly pop up is in cycles of explosion, followed by everybody just pretending it never happened. Oh, yeah. Good one. And this happens in families, but it also just happens in friend groups where you have those one or two friends where a couple times a year just something totally out there happens. And there's this screaming match and everyone's mad at each other and there's all of this conflict. And then the next day, everybody's just kind of going about their business as usual because like that's just the way this person is. And so this underlying issue that explodes on a often uh, increasingly more frequent cycle as time goes on is just swept under the rug every single time um, because the family doesn't feel like it can engage that problem in an authentic way. Yeah. You've brought up this really interesting point that I want to kind of nudge on or okay, explore, yeah. which is <clears throat> the whole, the L word, love, right? Yeah, yeah. And not a lot of, not a lot of love in either of these lists. Kind of interesting. You put forth this to me kind of interesting, provocative um, sure. point about this presumption that love is necessary for a healthy family and you're kind of raising questions about that. So what do you think about, what do you think about love? What do I think about love? What's, what's love got to do with it? Oh uh, yeah, there it was. You made the joke before I could dad. <laughs> Good job there. Um, yeah, my maybe slightly controversial take on this is that love is an emotion. It's a feeling. Love isn't a ground rule. You can't have a ground rule of everybody loving each other all the time because you're trying to police people's emotional states. And you can't police emotional states. We feel how we feel. So because of that, I don't think that love is necessary for a healthy family. Now, it might be necessary for a happy family, or maybe a degree of love is necessary for a really happy family. Um, but I think that all of those other qualities are what would keep us in bounds even when members of the family don't always like or love one another. And so I look at these all of these other features that we've named, like security and authenticity and a sense of belonging. This is all stuff that we can create, I think, in almost any kind of a functional family system. But I don't know if all of those things always lead to love, and I don't know if love is necessary to create any of those things. And because of that, I think of love as kind of almost a different variable sort of set off from the others that is really wonderful. And of course, we aspire to it inside of our families. But I don't know if it's necessary to create just a healthy system. There might be an example of a divorce or a significant change in relationship between the members of the family in it that takes romantic love off the table. But there could still be a really strong relationship there because we've curated a healthy system. And to me, that's actually kind of aspirational. So I grew up and re reflecting on my 
past, um, my memories um, really quickly here, my parents loved each other. And uh, I always felt they loved me. You know, I was mad at them a lot when I was a teenager. <laughs> you know, but I always felt they loved me. Um, mm. Being honest, I think I probably was not that in touch with my love. It was extremely scary for me to tell my first girlfriend uh, in Finland when I was 15 that I loved her. One of the scariest things I've ever done. And I remember really, really getting myself to tell my parents that I loved them uh, in my mid-20s. I hadn't said that, that word. And I know a number of families, a number of people who, like my dad, he would say that his he could not recall his father ever telling him that he loved him because that was the culture of his father there in North Dakota as a rancher dealing with a lot of difficulties. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of variation. All that said, I don't know anybody who hasn't told me that they never heard I love you from a parent who has not told me that with a pang of sadness mm -hmm. and pain. Mm -hmm. You know, people express love in lots of ways, but I guess I just think there's something missing. Maybe it's not an unhealthy family, but a, I think a happier family has, you know, a bedrock of mutual love. And, um, and a happier families, I think, have expressed love. There also needs to be skillfulness. I think about fundamentally, how would you describe good parenting? Loving and skillful. Yeah. I don't know. What do you, what do you make of all that? I wonder about the cultural part of all of this. Yeah. Uh, we come from a white European culture where for hundreds of years there has been a lot of emphasis on the importance of love, particularly romantic love, as like a driver of human behavior. Yeah. And I'm not a, uh, a cultural studies major or anything like that, but I studied Japanese in high school and in college and spent a little bit of time in Japan. And it's just a very different culture with regards to the way that love is expressed and how you think about love broadly. There's generally much more of an emphasis on things like familial duty. And so in part of this, I'm trying to think of it like a little universally. You can't think about these things totally universally, but I'm trying to lead into that a little bit with what we can emphasize and what I think most people can realistically replicate even in a variety of different circumstances. And so that's why I would emphasize the the core values that I did initially with a really strong uh, footnote of, hey, if you can get a lot of love in a family, that's great too. Yeah, I... Um... <clears throat> maybe I'm more of a romantic than you are. Yeah, uh, hey, and I, I love that about you. Great thing. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of a practicalist at the end of the day, I think. Yeah, I think you're you're a softy deep down for, oh, for sure. sure. So what this is leading me to from the standpoint of personal personal practice and personal value, first, I think it's really helpful to be aware of um, and in touch with a core of lovingness inside yourself. And you know that even with people who distance from you that you still love. Like it's been really important for me with certain key people in my, in my life to, to know that I could still love them even as they were being very unloving, mm -hmm. if not even hostile and really unjust toward me. You know, to, to hold on to and protect that freedom to, be, to love no matter what they do. Second thing I've seen is that with people who are important to you, uh, if it's true that you can recognize a core of lovingness toward you in them behind their prickly personality, behind their defenses, being able to recognize that in others um, can make you feel a lot better. Last, um, I do wanna make an argument for stretching ourselves and being loving, when you choose to do that, that there's a lot about lovingness that is loving at will. I withheld lovingness in my combat with my emotional wars with my parents for some years to, to my pain and my loss you know, over, over time. And so I, I think there's a place to just sort of think about it. You know, maybe you're in a relationship with someone and you've you know, really distanced or you've, you've withheld your lovingness toward them, you know, out of some kind of punishing of them or for some other reason. And to just take a big breath and to ask yourself, you know, could I be more loving here? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean waiving your rights, you know, but could I be more loving here? Could I 
Could I rest in my lovingness that doesn't have any strings attached? It's just genuine lovingness, and I could, I could express it more fully. Consider that for your own sake, if not for other people too. Yeah, I think that we took a ton of time with that question. It was a great question. It's a very deep question. We could do probably several episodes uh, alone on the qualities of healthy families and how they're different from unhealthy families and all of that. And we've done some episodes in the, the past that get to some similar questions. Uh, but I think that's all the time we have for that one right now. So I'm going to move on to the next one. I'm actually going to jump around in our order a little bit, Dad, because you used the word triangulation earlier. And we yeah. got a question about this. So here's the question. I love it when you introduce and explain psychological terms like enactments or triangulation. And I appreciate how you've said that knowing the terms doesn't mean we should use them casually or particularly during a heated situation like an argument. So what do you do when someone else uses psychological or technical terminology to get the upper hand during a conflict? For example, like a friend or a family member or boss telling you to stop projecting when you bring a valid criticism to them. What do you think about this, Dad? Yeah. <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> I've been in this spot before. It is a tough spot. Yeah. So first off, I think it's so really, really helpful to um, kind of build on a theme that's been recurring for you and me is to keep zeroing in on what's the payoff? What's mm. the function? What's the agenda behind this behavior? All right. And uh, it could just be that a person uh, has picked up a little psychological lingo. So maybe you could just take it at face value. On the other hand, very often when people play the card of co some kind of specialist dialect, some sort of professional term, they're moving into that one-up position where they are the knower. They see you better than you see yourself. Power they play, are the, yeah. They are the healthier one. And kaboom, right there in the room is a movement toward domination of sorts. So you can kind of see that. So I think it's quite, that would be the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing uh, I find is to be really careful about attributing states of mind to other people and being very alert to other people attributing it to you. When somebody says to you, you are projecting, or they say, that's your Oedipus complex. <laughs> I'm gonna throw in some more lingo here. You ready? You know, that's your unprocessed interject from early childhood and way too much primary process bubbling through. Right, what? <laughs> you know, like what? It and, becomes word uh, salad at a certain point, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting that in this life is that each of us is the world's leading expert on our own interior. Mm. You know, you're the expert on your interior. I'm the expert on my interior. And I think it's important to be careful about what we just presume about that we know better than somebody else what's actually really going on inside mm. them. Then more specifically, in the rough and tumble of a lot of relationships in which maybe both people have been you know, watching Oprah for 20 years or, you know, <laughs> you know mainlining <laughs> Mind Body language. Green yeah. every day, the latest update. It was good stuff, good stuff. You know, then you kind of slow it down and you go, well, is that actually true? And then you just mm -hmm. take it at face value. You kind of unpack it. You, you know, in other words, I'm, I'm saying we have ways of working through the, the move to dominance that sometimes is what's really going on here. Uh, we can work our way through the fairly reactivating presumption that another person is telling us how we really feel or what's really going on in our mind. You know, we work past that. Then you could take it at face value, right? Am I actually projecting onto you a quality in me? What do you think about all this? Well, you're, you're drawing a good distinction, I think, which is between is this a effective form of defense or is this an unskillful attempt to get a little insight? Yeah. You can generally separate it into those two categories. Is the person doing this as a power play or are they doing it to actually communicate something to you that might be of value? And you've, you've mostly addressed the, they're trying to do this to communicate something to you that might be of value. And I'm wondering what your take is on the power play part of it. I won't frame this as a recommendation, uh, but I'll frame it kind of as a personal evolution. So... We have essentially th three options. On the one hand, we could acquiesce. We could step into the frame. They're establishing a frame. And then we could 
kind of start trying to explain, let's say, why, well, I wasn't actually projecting. You're in the frame of their accusation, right? And, and you're kind of on your back heels already. And that's dangerous, yeah. Yeah, so one option is you're knocked onto your back heels and now you're trying to prove something to them in the frame of their accusation or placate them in some way. Yeah. The other, On the other extreme, you could go to war uh, and get riled up. You know, you might feel offended and you just go at it. There's kind of a middle place. And for quite a while, uh, I avoided conflict of a certain kind. And I've just grown increasingly inclined, maybe because I have the privilege that I can get away with this in our culture. But I've just grown increasingly inclined to draw on the lesson from our hunter-gatherer ancestors that if we don't identify freeloading and social freeloading, one form of which is bullying, if we don't name it, and if we don't actually create consequences for it, it goes, uh, it keeps on going because to the person who's doing it, it feels very rewarding. If there's not a cost to pay, they're going to keep doing it with you and with other people. So I've, I've just become, and I, and I think also in our culture, because it's so easy in hunter gather bands, if you ran that kind of number on somebody, you'd have to deal with them in a real way. But now with social media or online, people get away with this kind of stuff all the time. They attribute, for example, states of mind or real intentions or what you were really trying to do here to other people routinely, or they just kind of dump on people in a, you know, in a very harsh and bullying, intimidating even kind of way. And so more and more, I just think it's important for people to stand up. So then how do you do that effectively? Uh, if somebody did that to me, I mean, I would really quickly within a second or two register, oh, first, they're telling me how I feel. That's a big yellow flag right there. And in effect, they're pulling rank. And that's another yellow flag. The two together maybe are a red one. And, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> so then I have a range of options. One of them is just to smile and let it go by and not even uh, credit it with a response, right? Uh, another option might be to take a breath and just sort of, in a calm and somewhat and dignified and centered way, communicate whatever it is that's the essence that you want to communicate, that they've devalued or dismissed by um, accusing you of projecting or having some psychological issue that's, it, that's making you say or do this, rather than dealing with the merits, the validity of what you're communicating in its own right. So maybe you just simply restate it. Or... Particularly, I have to do this recently with somebody, and this is in a work environment, and I called it. I said, you know, you're attributing a lot of states of mind to me that actually are not what's really happening inside me. Second, I don't do that to you. Mm. You know, so I've gone now to a, a level. I did it in a civil and kind of humorous and somewhat light way, but shot across the bow, right? <laughs> oh, message delivered. So... You know, that's kind of the essence of it. How do you find that middle way for you that, you know, you don't have to come in guns blazing, but on the other hand, you're just not going to be pushed around by that yeah. sort of psychological uh, trumping of what you're trying to say in its essence. I also think that there's a place sometimes for trying to separate out the conversation. And because what the person is trying to do is they're trying to shift the playing field fundamentally. They're mm. shifting it away from their behavior to their attribution of why you are calling out their behavior. Yeah. There's no actual response in it. There's an implicit lessening of, of the badness of whatever it is that they're doing, but there's no actually response in it. They're not saying, I don't think that my behavior is bad. They are allowing themselves to not have to say, I don't think my behavior is bad by moving the playing field away because that would make them look bad in a certain way. Um, and so there's a real place for communicating something along the lines of, hey, if you've got issues with my behavior or if you want to unpack some process issue that we're having in our interaction, I'm open to that at another time. But right now, this is the issue that I'm having very specifically. I think it's a narrow issue and that's what I'm engaging 
And so you can kind of separate out sometimes uh, the egg white from the egg yolk a little bit here of the interaction. And that's also really, really effective in our relationships with other people. Um, yeah. Like we had a, a conversation recently about navigating moments of conflict with a, a significant other, a family member, a friend, people you care about. Um, and one of the most effective things to do there, at least that I found, is to do what you can to separate content from process and to have a process conversation about the process and a content conversation about the content, but to not have them at the same time because that can get a little thorny. One version of this, just to finish on, yeah. is when one person says to another, oh, you're such an introvert, or oh, you're such a Leo, <laughs> or oh, you're such a seven in the Enneagram. And suddenly you feel reduced to mm -hmm. some stereotype or some um, fixed pattern that you're pinned to, sort of like a moth pinned to a styrofoam board, you know, with a needle, you know, through its core. Through its core. And ick. So I, I find it's important to be really careful about that, really careful about that. And I don't like it. <laughs> you know, I think it's one thing when people are kind of kidding a little bit, like I am a social seven in the mm -hmm. Enneagram. And, and uh, I, I, you know, there's a little bit of amusement, you know, with people who know each other well. And it's, it's a shorthand way of summarizing things. Your mom and I have little shorthand ways of summarizing things in that way. But otherwise, gosh, I don't know. The older I get, the more I know about people, professionally and otherwise, the more struck I am by the complexity and mystery mm. of, this, of the mind and the psyche. And I think giving people room to breathe, giving people room to be multitudes, uh, I just think is it's a great gift we can give to others, and including to ourselves. I feel good about where we left that question at right. this point. Spent our time with it. And so we've got another one that relates to maybe some similar kind of stuff having to do with uh, the perception of an incident. Here it is. My mom is highly sensitive, and she recently had a conflict with my new partner. Due to her perceived severity of the incident, which was wildly different from my and my partner's perception of the incident, it got blown so far out of proportion that I'm not sure how to repair the relationship or if it's repairable. Do you have advice for dealing with loved ones or people in general when their perception of reality is different from your own? Three headlines here. Generally best to not argue about the past, but instead focus on agreements about the future while emphasizing the experiences of the people involved and paying attention to what could be the underlying need or want that's in play from someone who seems to have an inexplicably intense reaction to a fairly small thing. So to kind of unpack that, working backwards, I find myself immediately wondering um, if maybe what the mother wants is a closer relationship with the person who sent in the question because it sounds like the mother is reacting to the partner and maybe the mother wants the adult child uh, to side with the mother, right? Even against the partner, which would be a form of triangulation, by the mm -hmm. way, to go back to that. So maybe that's a little bit in the mix. Uh, a second thing is that we can argue forever about what happened and what it meant it's much faster to get right at the actual feelings and to join with the feelings. We can reserve our judgment and we can also recognize that some people are fairly impaired uh, and li or limited in their capacity to repair or to remember even what happened. A lot of people actually don't remember exactly the word that was used or the tone that was used or which happened first. But meanwhile, you can really focus on what it felt like for them. And you can be really nurturing with your, let's say, aging mother about how it felt and what it was like and stay out of arguments about, you know, what happened or what it meant because you have the right to see it your way. But you can really join emotionally, empathically and compassionately um, uh, with what it was like for her, what it was like to be that other person. And that puts you on really solid ground. You know, you're not giving up your rights, but you really are entering into their world in a, in a kind and supportive and friendly way. So I think that. Mm. 
And then going forward, really focusing on, okay, well, mom, the next time we have dinner with with uh, me and my partner and you, uh, just want you to know we, we really hear you. We really hear you and 100% um, want to really put in correction going forward. Uh, just got it. Thank you. Really wonderful. And, and then do, 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 go on down that road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a great way to stop one incident from snowballing into great a point. whole thing with another person that has that kind of lasting impact on the relationship. Again, from my you know long history, I have just seen so many families go off the rails. Mm-hmm. You know, like a dear friend of mine um, had his mother-in-law uh, die uh, last night. And so I'm, my heart's a little heavy as well because I knew her as a really beautiful uh, person. My friend is dealing with a fair amount of sadness about the fact that he was, you know, a little distant, a little busy, a little brusque with his mother-in-law at certain times. And, and yet there came an irrevocable turn when nothing could be repaired anymore because she was in so much pain, she needed to be very heavily medicated and they could not have a repair conversation. And he was stuck with that. And well, I've just become kind of myself much more careful actually about my part mm-hmm. in relationships, removing causes for offense, being attentive, um, you know, letting a lot of pitches sail on by <laughs> that I would have swung at uh, 30 years ago. Um, just something to think about, but the long game, little tiny things can get really weird. You know, comments at a dinner table with a little too much alcohol, stuff can get really weird. I just kind of want to mention, you know, there is a place for carefulness and first of all, do no harm. Yeah, and this is a really great segue into our next question that we got. Mm. Hi, Rick and Forrest. I'd like your help in healing my relationship with my teenager. Yeah. Oh, man. I have a 52-year-old father of an amazing 17-year-old daughter. I survived emotional abuse and neglect from my parents as a kid, which I unconsciously passed on to my daughter. Basically, I've gone from being the victim to being the perpetrator. My daughter will be leaving for college in less than a year, and I desperately want to begin healing my relationship with her and rebuilding her trust in me. What can I do? It's an incredibly touching question, and... I, th- I don't know the exact situation, you know, I've- Depends a lot on what exactly has gone on here. Yeah, yeah seen sure. situations. Uh, my hunch is that some things would be really helpful. So I'm not hearing a co-parent in the mix. Sometimes if there is a co-parent, that co-parent can be a bridge. Sometimes the co-parent's part of the problem. Let's suppose that the co-parent is neutral or not helpful. First, do the inner work of, in AA language, a fearless and searching inventory of your own part in the matter. And sort out for yourself in a way that you and I wrote about in our book, Resilient. Sort out for yourself what was a moral fault, uh, what was just simply unskillful, uh, and what was like kind of a nothing burger, but it had an impact. Mm-hmm. You know, it, was, it was like inadvertent or what, or maybe there was a misunderstanding, but it had an impact. So sort it out. And also what's skillful correction. So you own it inside yourself. Second, um, I think that it's so easy for things to happen in a kid's adolescence that set the course of the relationship for the next 30 years. That totally happened with me. I didn't start to really repair with my parents until I was in my 40s. And I'm a guy who is deeply trained. And I still let stuff slide because on any given day, it was just easier, just easier. Things can acquire a lot of momentum. So now's the time. Now's the time. You know, if you can, you know, don't wait, don't keep making up a good reason why not today, not today, not today. So what, what might help? It might help to just a very simple statement of responsibility, remorse, and apology that is yours to own. You just communicate that. Like, wow. And leave out the ways that, let's say, the adolescent has had their part. I mean, adolescents have their part. I've seen a lot of situations where parents were just wonderful 
and the kids for all kinds of reasons, including cultural models, were just nasty to their parent, endlessly nasty for no reason, really. But they saw that that's how they were supposed to be in the movies. And that's what their peers were doing to their parents. So they were just that way. I mean, the kid gets a pass because they're a kid in terms of responsibility, but they were intentional fully intentional for years. I was fully intentional during my own adolescence uh, to withhold warmth and affection from my parents. And I own that. So that said, that said, from the standpoint of the parent who's trying to build bridges, now's not the time to process what your kid has done to you. Right? <laughs> because yeah. that just complicates things. Have your apology be completely clean, completely unreserved, very genuine, uh, don't expect that your apology will disappear the impact of all the stuff you did when they were vulnerable and developing and really needed you to not be a jerk. Um, and then really invite the kid into some kind of healing process to the extent they're willing to do it in a really sincere and vulnerable way. My experience with this, just from my position as a 35-year-old guy who does not yet have kids but has had parents, um, is that a lot of the time parents want to move to the emotional relational level with their kids before their kids want to during mm -hmm. these repair processes. And the kid really wants functionality. They want to know very specifically how you are planning to be different in the future than you were in the past. And they're not going to be willing most of the time to go to the emotional relational level until you have dealt with the practical level of whatever the behavior was that sure. led to them feeling however it was that they felt. So inviting into the healing process could look like emotional relational, but it could also just look like having a very practical plan for how things are going to be different in the future. So for the person who's writing this question, some questions for them. Like, are you planning on going to counseling? Have you made a clear commitment to change your behavior? Has your daughter expressed certain things that would allow her to move back toward that feeling of security that we were talking about earlier? Um, I think that that's a really, really important next step. So you begin, just as you were saying, Dad, with that acceptance, acknowledgement, responsibility taking, yeah. and then you move into, hey, what is my plan for how things are not going to be this way in the future? You have to definitely have that in, absolutely. I, I find that many parents with their adolescence uh, are not vulnerable. Mm. How the kid responds, you know, that's kind of out of your hands, actually. And not turning the, the kid into your therapist, but just being kind of authentic, open, kind of real. That has a lot of weight. And don't expect the child to suddenly change, you know, on the spot. And it could take them a while to really believe that you've turned a corner. But I think how often we're, we don't just um, soften and talk about what's real. It's like, wow, I'm really hurting here. You know, I'm, I'm really hurting. I'm, I'm really feeling the, you know, we're civil, but it's chilly. Uh, I'm really feeling um, kind of sad. And you don't, you don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to fix it. I'm just sharing. You know, I just have seen so many situations where that opportunity was missed because on any given day, it seemed like a bad idea, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then the days become years and then boom, your kid's gone. There's clearly just a balance there between mm -hmm. sharing your feelings and making other people responsible for them. 100%. Because one of the biggest sources of friction that I've seen in the family systems of my friends, particularly in situations where the parent and the kid are, are at some distance with each other. Um, over and over again, what comes up for the kids is the feeling that the parent was trying to make them responsible for their emotional experience. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the parent just frankly like wasn't sturdy enough. They weren't yeah. resilient enough. They weren't able to bear the commentary that the child offered about hey, you did these things and it had this impact. And all of a sudden we're moving into rather than cycles of deflection and defense, cycles of emotional decay and disturbance, where all of a sudden there's this huge upwelling of emotional vulnerability and oh my God, and I feel so bad. And it becomes essentially a plea for soothing from the child. Um, it's just like another way to get to closeness. So it, to your point, maybe dad, you can err on either side here. 
you can err on the side of being a stiff upper lip, strong father figure version, never expressing your own vulnerability, never letting your child see you bleed even a little bit. And you can err on the other side where all of a sudden your child becomes responsible for curating their emotions so that you can deal with them. Um, And you don't want to fall into either either pitfall here. Totally true. And I think as a parent with a, you know, young adult, teenager, let's say, or, you know, kids in their thirties and so forth. Uh, what's your primary commitment? Is mm. it to feeling better yourself or helping them feel better themselves? Because, mm. you know, to generalize, if an adult growing up has this encapsulated, Jung used the word complex, <laughs> that's another technical term to not throw <laughs> around, oh, that's your complex talking. You know, anyway, basically, if there's this, I think of it as like this scabbed over a wound, you know, underneath the scab is pain and pus and the scab keeps it in place. If there's an encapsulated scab over a wound with regard to a parent, and these are primary relationships, that's not the greatest thing in the world for the mental health of the individual. So a parent an older parent could have an interest as a nurturing parent in helping their adult child, you know, heal around that scabbed over wound. And with a full-throated willingness to be a participant in that healing process, that's about the child's healing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the parent could also feel wrong, especially by an adult child, uh, who, uh, for various reasons, or could feel just a history as a human, a lot of wounding from a really hostile adolescent, you know, growing up. But that's that's your stuff as the aging parent, and hopefully mm. you're you're finding your own way into healing that, and and maybe there'll be a healing of that after your your adult child has has found a healing themselves, mm-hmm. based on that being your primary focus. Yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned a little bit ago was a willingness for things to take time. Yeah. And I think that that's such a huge part of this. And it's part of the reason that uh, when you said earlier, hey, don't wait, is important because these things take time. And something I I heard once about breakups is that you should expect to uh, be in recovery from the breakup for at least as long as the relationship was. So if you had a three-year relationship, you should kind of expect that for at least three years, that person will be bouncing around your head in some capacity. I don't know if that's true or not. Your mileage may vary. Different situations are different. All of that good stuff. But if there was some really meaningful break of rapport between this person and their child for years where there was some inappropriate behavior of one kind or another in the space and it was really impacting the child, you should absolutely expect it to take years to recover from that process, I personally believe. Related to this whole conversation, Dad, there's something I've been thinking about recently that I would like to sort of unpack with you or ask you about. Um that kind of relates to this, and and it was just me chewing on it. Uh, do you mind if we kind of engage that for a minute? It's not really another question from a person. Oh, great. Cool. It's just kind of like a little bonus thing, I guess, at the end of the episode. So the premise of this question that we got was, I've been doing this bad behavior. And the person acknowledges that the behavior is bad. They said, hey, I was traumatized by my parents. I've passed that on now to my daughter. Wow, from the seat that I have right now, I can see the ways in which I participated in the cycle. It was a bad cycle. I did a thing that was problematic. Okay, so there's no deflection going on here. There's no like, I didn't really do something bad and they just thought it was bad and so on and so on. One of the things that I've seen in people who get to that point is a willingness to go 50% or 80% around a behavior that's problematic, but not 100%. So let's say, theoretically, that the daughter says to the dad, hey, dad, I feel uncomfortable when you drink excessively around me. The dad might interpret that as, oh, I can have a beer. A beer's not excessive. And in my view on this, no, you get no beers. (laughs) And you get no beers for an extended period of time around this person. Because when you move into having the one beer, they're already activated. 
their security has already been threatened because again and again and again, one beer became two beer, became three beers. And so what you can see is that there's this common tension that emerges when somebody starts to change some kind of a problematic behavior. And it's the, uh, what I like to call the, but aren't I doing better problem? Hmm. Because the person goes from getting drunk and problematic a few times a week to a few times a month. And in their experience, they're doing so much better. So people should be applauding them and being like very gracious and understanding when they lapse, right? Well, there might be a space for positive encouragement and moral support and all of that good stuff. But there are certain behaviors where the baseline is just zero. And any deviation from that baseline is problematic, right? Now we all err. We're all human. We all make mistakes. That's okay. Like, get it. You know, I'm probably going to get too inebriated at least one more time in my life. But like, The baseline is zero, and you really got to kind of start from that. So what do you think about this, Dad? I think it's a great question, and um, I'm thinking of a a moment with multiple clients where I started, I I demonstrated by dragging my fingernail across the skin of my hand. And I pointed out that if you just do it 10 times, it's not a deal. Even 100 times, it's not a deal. But the thousandth time, your fingernail approaches, the hand wants to flinch away yeah. because we've grown sensitized around something. And with couples, if I'm trying to help them reforge a relationship, uh, if you think about a leg that's been broken, that's now in a cast and it's trying to reset, you don't want to stress the fracture. So you're, you're exactly right. Uh, going to zero is the phrase mm-hmm. I use. I think you used a similar phrase. Yeah. And that's actually been uh, very useful for me in certain situations uh, to just realize, okay, I need to go to zero about this. And I'm, I'm going to zero, like literally in, in the field of awareness of that other person, that will never happen again. And so, yeah, you just go to zero uh, about something absolutely useful. On the other hand, you're getting at a really interesting thing about um, to what extent do we give other people the right to put demands on our own behavior? And then maybe pragmatically you decide for yourself, but then you think, what's the greater good? What's the, what's the larger, the game, the long game to win? And oftentimes you just kind of go, okay. And you, you zero out. You just zero it out. Their cause for complaint. Other times though, at a certain level, you just kind of go, you know, I don't know if I can give you that. And then you have to see if that could be a deal breaker in the relationship. Yeah, my perspective on this is driven by the premise that the parties acknowledge that this behavior is problematic. Mm. That's sort of where I'm starting with the with uh, this. Yeah. And there's been an appeal made by a member and one of the other members responds with, okay, yeah, I want to repair my relationship with you and therefore I'll have some movement on this behavior. What I then see often happen is you get into some legislation about how much of the behavior is the right amount of the behavior. And the answer to me almost always is zero. If you want to get to real repair with the other person where they actually trust you in a full, complete way, you really cannot do a lot of legislation about how frequently you are allowed to fill in the blank. I agree. I think that's very smart. And there's a technical reason for it too in terms of variable variable reinforcement. It's the hardest uh, to extinguish. So let's you got A and B. So A is reacting to and doesn't like when B does something, B does X. So you're trying to build trust again. If intermittently, almost randomly varying at an average frequency over the course of a year, B does X, but it's intermittent and variable, it's almost impossible to, in technical language, extinguish the reactivity of A to B doing that because then also A is always on pins and needles at what B might do next at the next time. Yeah, and going to zero and being completely trustworthy about that um, and giving the other person assurances, not because you're trying to placate them, but just because you're you're really sincere. You are sincerely committed to going to zero about that, at Mm -hmm. least around them. Yeah, it it can be tough because you have somebody where they're like, ah, but I've really been so good for fill in the blank. Yeah. Six months, 
three days, depending on the person, <laughs> two years, whatever it is. Like, ah, oh, I have been so good for this long period of time. Can't you just cut me a break? It, yeah. It's an appeal to compassion and common humanity and all of this stuff that's like really understandable. And there's a part of me that's like, yeah, man, I can cut you a break, but I don't know if your daughter can. And that's the person that you care about. So yeah, yeah. that's where I kind of keep on coming back to with this. And I also just think that it like gets us out of the mud. It gets us out oh, of the mud. Right. It, get, it gets yeah. us into like, what are we actually going to do here? Great. Let's go all the way if we're really going to care about this. Um, we just fight so many battles over things that long run we don't care about. But long run we really do care about our relationship with this other person. Yeah. There's a fact that understandably, if you could do it once, you could do it again. Yeah. Right? So and understandably, uh, A is looking at B like, you did it once, you could do it again. So uh, one is infinitely more than none, in effect, <laughs> and, right? And so you, if what you need, if you're the A person who really needs them to go to zero, if, if you're the B person who cares about the A person and cares about your relationship, uh, it's really important to make a categorical shift. I think that's what you're getting at for us, the difference between qualitative and quantitative. You're shifting from less to none. Yeah. And that's, that's a the categorical shift. difference. Yep. And to be willing to own none. I'm going to go to none uh, and really communicate that most sincere commitment to the other person. And even think a little bit about conditions that will help you. Totally. You know, totally. Like get, the, get the weed out of the house or, you know, um, you know, just to, uh, you know, think about maybe other people involved too, but yeah. Go sure, to yeah, like behavioral reinforcement. There's all yeah. this stuff that we can do, but what I found in my life is when somebody makes the category change, when they say, hey, I'm willing to go to none, can you help me by fill in the blank? Other people are so much more responsive because because it's clear. You know, it just, it, the sky's clear and the seas part, the whole thing. We go to clarity because the agreement is so understood by everybody involved. And in this case, assuming that the person isn't, again, to use my example of like alcohol consumption, assuming that they're not an alcoholic in recovery who's trying to go to zero in their life as a whole, and they're just being concerned about their relationship with this one person, you can do behaviors with other people who are not sensitized to them in the way that this person is. But when this person is around, the category is clearly established. Well, I think that's a pretty good uh, good note to end today's conversation on, Dad. This has been really interesting. We ended up really uh, playing with the, the theme of working inside of and healing our family systems really here. This, this was interesting today. You bet. I think about how so much literature is about family discord. Yeah. Most of Shakespeare is, you know, the tragedies are really about dysfunctional families and the consequences of that. I thought this episode was really interesting, and I really enjoyed answering a number of mailbag questions. All of the questions, though they were very different, got to these two themes that I thought came up over and over again. And the first is, how can we build more healthy and functional family systems? And how can we deal with conflict when it does inevitably emerge inside of our families? And how can we, in particular, repair the wounds that almost everybody receives just by virtue of being part of a family system? And then connected to that, how can we deal with situations where another person experienced something very differently from how we did? Maybe somebody has a very different memory of something than we do. Maybe somebody is attributing an explanation to our behavior that we don't agree with. Whatever it is, how can we navigate situations like that? It's hard to summarize everything that we talked about today because we addressed four very distinct questions. So what I'll do is I'll go through here and I'll name each of the questions that we talked about and maybe a couple of key takeaways for me. The first question got to the routines and shared values of happy families. And for both Rick and I, there was this real emphasis placed on security and authenticity. And the two feed each other, right? When we're in a secure environment, we feel like we can be authentic about the nature of our experience. But if we fear that if we're honest, we are punished, well, then we're never going to come forward with our true selves. And that's something that you see in less healthy family systems over and over again. The second question was, what can you do when somebody else uses 
psychological or technical language to get one over on you during a conversation. And Rick began by saying, well, for starters, it's helpful to uh, take a moment to step back and go, hmm, am I maybe doing this thing? But assuming that they're doing it as a power play, you can respond in a variety of different ways. And in that, there's actually a really good teaching, which is do what you can to suss out on your own or ask directly from them what the motives are for what they're doing. Are they really trying to have a authentic communication with you? Are they trying to deepen your relationship? Are they trying to maybe say, hey, bite the bullet, and this is something I've been holding on to for a long time, but Forrest, wow, I just really think you do this over and over again in our relationship. Is this authentic? Or are they doing it as a means to control you and to display power inside of the relationship? Then the third question was, what can you do when two people remember an incident very, very differently? And how can you reconcile after that? And our big uh, piece of advice there was do whatever you can to not get trapped in comparing notes about what happened and instead move as rapidly as possible toward from now on. People can argue endlessly about what exactly somebody said or the exact tone that they said it in. And it's just really tough to, to get to a shared agreement about those particulars. But what you can form a strong agreement on is, okay, what are we all going to do from now on? And if you see that somebody just isn't willing to talk about from now on, and even if they do make an agreement, they regularly break it, well, that's a really strong indication to change the nature of your relationship with that person. Then finally, we took a long time at the end talking about what we can do to heal the relationships with members of our family systems. And particularly in situations where we have a degree of power over somebody else, for instance, in the case of a parent and a child. I found that conversation really interesting. We emphasized a couple of things. First, the importance of acceptance and accountability. Second, creating a clear plan, again, from now on, for how behavior is going to be different. And then third, really appreciating inside of yourself that change takes time, and particularly in situations where everybody acknowledges that there has been a significant breach inside of a relationship, you should really expect the healing timeline to be months, if not years. It is rare for people to have a white light moment where everything is just forgiven and we all understand that everyone has turned over a new leaf because we're talking about a violation of trust, and trust takes time to develop. So it's really understandable that the healing of a trust violation would take a lot of time. Then at the end of the conversation, Rick and I talked for a while about standards of behavior and the value of going to zero with somebody. When you know that something happened inside of a relationship that was problematic for another person, that person has come to you and has said, hey, this behavior is problematic, and you have looked at it, and you go, yes, I agree that this behavior is problematic. If you then go from there, into a lot of argument around how frequently you are allowed to do this problematic behavior, man, that is a dangerous game to play. And it is not one that I would, I would recommend to pretty much anybody. And instead, what I would recommend is going to zero, going to that category shift that Rick was talking about, where we shift from one instance of something to absolutely none of it. Because the reality is, that the other person is going to be extremely sensitized to the behavior for the foreseeable future. And when I say the foreseeable future, I mean pretty much forever. And the reality is that there are behaviors where once is too many times. The baseline for them is none. And any deviation from that baseline is fundamentally problematic. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it now on. And hey, you can leave a rating, a positive review, maybe a comment if you're watching it on YouTube. That really helps us out. And hey, you can always tell a friend about it. It's probably the best way that we have to reach new people. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a couple of dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll receive a bunch of bonuses like expanded show notes, transcripts of the episodes, and ad-free versions of everything that we create. Until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.